Thank you very much. And uh, Professor Jacob, he is my lovely host professor. Uh, with her, his help, I'm really enjoying my life here. <laughs> and uh, I'm really very happy to have this chance to offer this presentation just before I go back to China. <laughs> but I'm really unlucky to offer this presentation at this special time. I know that. It's time for, for what? <laughs> Not only for Chinese New Year, it's time for lunch. <laughs> are you hungry? No. No? You, you are not hungry? Oh, uh, this gift will not give it to you. <laughs> Who is hungry? We're going to eat you later at lunch. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Architecture food. Okay. Uh, today, I will give a uh, short speech on this. Before this, I would like to introduce that in the last two decades, there are two most notable phenomenon appeared in Chinese higher education. One is the development of world-class university is aimed to improve international competitive and uh, to uh, uh, improve academic reputation. Okay, but it's only uh, a very small group of university attended this program. And uh, the, another most notable phenomenon is the massification of higher education. Its aim is to enroll as many students as possible to meet domestic demands. So today I will not talk about world class university. It's also a very interesting topic, maybe next time, after two years. Because when I come back to China, I have to stay in China at least two years before I come back again. <laughs> so maybe next, after two years. So today I will focus my presentation on the massification of higher education. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, I will answer three questions. And uh, my main objective is, first is to describe the massification of higher education, to answer the question, what has happened. And then the second objective is to analyze the multiple context, a very complex context of the massification, okay, to explain why, why that happened. And uh, if I have time, I will give my own idea and comments on uh, what had happened is to evaluate is about how about the massification, okay, okay. OK, think it. This is the topic. What is massification of higher education? <laughs> Would you like to answer this question? No, I'd rather not, actually. Oh. Hear you. Um, A lot of gifts in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> Who would like to answer this question? Or tell us something about it? OK, thank you. I'll kind of come back with the question. Does yeah. it mean <laughs> the extension of education for everyone? Extension for everyone? In, yeah. Something like this. But it, if it's a expansion for everyone, it is not mass higher education. It's called universal higher education. But thank you very much. I will give you a, a gift. Today the topic is the education in China. And uh, very fortunate, I get a book with the same name of this syndrome. It's bilingual. The title is Education in China. OK, <laughs> it's a little game. <laughs> you help me. <laughs> OK, next one. OK, I will answer this question myself, OK? Because we have no time to think, OK? Ah, we will come to this gentleman. Oh, he's very famous in China. Do you know that? Do you know him? You don't know him. Sorry for my ignorance. <laughs> oh, <I> mean, <laughs> and uh, he is a very famous professor of higher education at the University of Berkeley, uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, he, uh, he is credited as the first person to 
put forward this definition and the term mass high, high education in 1973 in a report, a very long report. But later, this report reprinted as a small book. I'm very excited to find this book in the main library because I really like it. Why? Because this book is just as old as me. <laughs> <laughs> it's 41 years old. Okay, I really love this book. It's really a masterpiece uh, about the massification of higher education. And he is also internationally recognized scholar in higher education studies. Okay, for example, the scholars in China study higher education. Okay, often read this. Okay, but here I can find the original printing of this book. Oh, great. <laughs> and uh, in this report, he gave a definition, but I just revised it. The massification of higher education is a transition from elite to mass higher education. It emphasizes the number, emphasizes student access. Okay, it's it's something about expansion. Okay, ah, this is a really smart guy. Now uh, the the this short report and some and uh, some other uh, report related to this topic is called Martin Toro's theory of higher education expansion. If we come to this uh, theory or this this description. We can have an operational definition of mass higher education. According to Martin Turo, he divided the higher education into three phases. The first one is when a GER, you know, you can know how to calculate the GER, okay. And the first one is elite. It's only that the GER is less than 15%. Okay, very small number. So, the massification is in the higher education from transformed from an elite when it's GER less than 15% and reach to 15 per, between 15% and 50. This is the transition from a small number to a large number, but not for everyone. If, if it is for everyone, it's in the third stage, universal higher education. But I will not talk about this because maybe after 100 years ago I will talk about this, okay? And okay, next one. Ah, okay, I will describe the massification in three aspects. The first one is the absolute size of the system, the whole system. This is the a curve, a figure, describe the uh, enrollment of Chinese higher education, especially the regular college and the, and the universities. It began from 1949. I think you, everyone you know that. It's the fun, foundation of the uh, communist China. And we can divide it, the, the curve into three periods. From the 1979 to 19, this, okay, is a, a period of very slow growth. At that time, China just follow the Soviet model. And uh, very slow. Sometimes even stop. And uh, after this, the post Chairman Mao is come to the second stage. And from this to 1999. OK, this morning we come often to the year 1999. Eh? It's the second stage. Just now, I'm very happy to find uh, a lady that, Maggie. Maggie ever went to my hometown many years ago? Here? Okay. I, I know that Maggie went to my hometown in the second stage as an English uh, language teacher, right? Okay, thank you very much. You help us to improve the process, the massification, okay? And after 1999, it's come to another stage, from slow to modest. The second stage is modest, but it's steadily grow. But the third stage is very rapid, just like the plane. Wow, boom. Okay, it's very rapid. And the absolute size of the system. So after 
especially after 1999, several years of rapid growth. So, yeah, <laughs> China become number one. Oh, and uh, in a very few years, and by, nine, by 2010, China become the number one and the biggest country with so many college graduates. And uh, okay, the percentage is uh, almost 20%. Ah, it's too large, okay. And the second one is the United States. Uh, and I, okay, I'm very proud of that, but I'm also worried about that. Okay, next. And uh, the, the second aspect I would like to describe the massification is another cave. It's an absolute size of per regular institution. That means the growth is not only in, this, in the whole system, it's also in the individual, individual institution. That means almost every college and institution participate in the massification. For example, my university, the, the one, Huazhong University of Science and Technology, is one of the top 10 universities in China and uh, is a key university in 1998, every year, we only enroll a little more than 2,000 in 1998. In 1999, that year, we enrolled more than 4,000. And in 2000, my university merged with another college. Okay, that year, we enrolled new students 8,000. From that time on, okay, every year, more than 8,000. Even now, our president wants to reduce the number. It will be very hard because every school, every department wants to say no. Okay, so it's easy to increase, harder to decrease. Okay, and uh, the absolute size of the per regular institution in a very short time just tripled. So if you go to China, you will find a lot of many universities as big as this Big Ten. In China, it's not Big Ten. It's Big 100, at least. <laughs> okay. Uh, the th third aspect I would like to describe is the gross enrollment ratio. Okay, 1998. 1998 is less than 10%. And if we can make it uh, ahead, for example, in 1993, it's only 5%. Very small percentage. At that time, it's very competitive, very hard to study in college and universities. But after 1999, okay, rapid growth. And uh, only in nine years, Chinese GER increased from 5% to 15%, nine years. United States, I remember, is from 1911 to 1941. Used 30 years to increase its re GER from 5% to 15%. And uh, another Asian country, Japan, you all know that. Japan used 25. And the most um, advanced and their industrial countries more, used more than 20 years. Only China used <laughs> nine years, <laughs> too quick. Okay, <laughs> so we come to again, the year 1999. Why this year become a cut, cut off point or the turning point of higher education in China? Oh, it's very, very important year in China. Not only in China's higher education, but also in China's, as, as a whole, as a society. I still have a lot of present. <laughs> who, who would like to answer this question? I'm really hungry. If you find that my sh voice is shaking, it's not only because I feel nervous, <laughs> but because I'm hungry. <laughs> OK, I will. Who would like to answer it? A little bit hint. Huh? A little bit hint. Mm. Him, yeah. Eh? Prime Minister Zhu Rongji. Prime Minister Zhu Rongji, you know him. 
Ah, <laughs> uh, of course. Yeah, something about this guy. Yeah. The uh, Premier Zhu Rongji. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, you show the, the increased number of students, but you have to think also there needs to be more professors trained to serve those students. Mm. And whether or not they're available and they, mm. they have advanced degrees and are they qualified, that's an issue too, right? Yes. And uh, I will uh, address this question in my third part, evaluate. But I can, uh, now I can talk about it. Yes, a lot of new students come. So at that time, if graduate here want to find a job in Chinese university and college, it will be very easy, a piece of cake. <laughs> Maybe you here get a PhD in 1998 or 1999. Maybe you can directly be a full professor. But now, it's not the case. Maybe you have to first be a post doctor for two years in my university. Then you may be a faculty. Because now, a lot of uh, faculties have been hired. But at that time, yes, we need a lot of new faculties. But most of them are new and inexperienced. That is one of very big issue concerning about teaching college. Thank you very much. OK. My dear professor. <laughs> Thank you. It's a new year. Hi. Ah, it's about happiness from the inside out. OK. <laughs> OK. Thank you. Uh, uh, you needed that. I think everyone needs happiness, right? <laughs> OK. Uh, Time is really limited. I really have a lot of to share with you. But I have to be quick, because my professor will kick me out if I cannot finish. <laughs> OK, first let's come to the larger context. Yes, the expansion or the massification of the higher education, generally speaking, is rational, reasonable. Because there are a lot of factors contributed. That means China really needed it. And we can find a lot of aspects to uh, find the course to this phenomenon. And for example, education, I think it's in the, in the logic of the expansion. Maybe it's the most important one. But in China, since the higher education is highly centralized and controlled by the government, so the uh, ex external factors are also very, very important. Especially when it comes to the massification of higher education since 1999. But the education factor is also very important. And uh, especially when uh, the elementary and uh, the education, the basic education has become universal in China. So a lot of high school students want to attend. And uh, the university will also want to enroll more students. Why? Because after 1999, China, Chinese universities, charge students. And the tuition are raised very rapidly. So the college and the university are eager to enroll many students to increase their tuition. So a lot of factors. And the economic, you maybe know that after 1999, China experienced rapid economic growth. Lasting, hmm, I think it's still lasting. <laughs> so uh, in order to improve the economic growth, they need a more educated person, more skilled talents. And uh, the political is that the government wants to meet the demands from various sides. OK. And uh, another one is international. Because after 99, China just opening up and have economic reform. Mm, and uh, become a part of international world. And at that time, the international world has a very, uh, very general trend that expand higher education. Not only in America, not only in Latin America, not only in Europe, but also in Asia. China is one of the leading countries to expand it. And at that time, the GER of Chinese higher education is not only lower, much lower than the industrialized country, for example, United States and Britain. It's also lower than many developing countries. 
many poorer countries that even have a higher GER than China. Oh, so China also uh, has been influenced by the international factors and also a lot of another aspects, okay? Ah, oh, I'm lucky to still have 10 minutes, okay. Oh, this is comes to, okay, this is just like blasting fuse. What it like is the, a light, and the premier Zhu Rongji is like the guy. Uh, adopted a, a suggestion from an economist Tang Ming to expand the Chinese higher education in three years, double its enrollment, and to postpone the employment of high school graduate and uh, to stimulate economic growth. And then the premier said, oh, this suggestion is very good. Okay, we do it right now. So in 1999, the Chinese higher education, oh, just like a plane. Okay, raise up. And uh, then become this. Okay, it, about, it comes to the mastication of higher education in a very rapid pace. Hmm, this rapid pace brought a lot of new things and uh, have a lot of outcomes and consequences. If I can count it, oh, it have so many. Okay, I'll just mention some of it. One of it is the attitudes toward access to uh, higher education. And uh, before it has been a privilege, now it being, has been expected obligation. And, uh, before, maybe we want, oh, it's really lucky to be a college student. But now, it will be, I have to be a college student. Become an obligation. And the college student change or not. 10 years ago, I will find it as a teacher for 20 years. I will find that at that time, I found it's very difficult to handle the modern technology, the PPD, a lot of things. But now, I find that the most challenging thing is that the student, the classroom is really complex with different students, with different background, and a different orientation. Oh, it's quite different. So how to handle the classroom with the different students? They are hom homogeneous to heterogeneous. Another one is the institution. Oh, change or not restructured. And uh, we have a lot of language about it, but I don't want to uh, give it a detail about it. I just want to say that. And uh, in 1998, most public, very few private. But in China, we don't call it private. We call it land government. <laughs> but in the same. And uh, many national, at that time, uh, uh, the top university and then the key university are all central agency ran. But in 1998 and in the following several years, a lot of universities are just transferred to province. Okay, and uh, it also transferred from professional, very professional. At that time, we have 12 kinds of professional schools. But now, are all expanded. For example, for example, my university name is Science and Technology. It seems, it sounds like professional, but it's really pro comprehensive, just like this one. Okay, the management uh, centralized to decentralized based on experience, based on data. Oh, a lot of changes and a lot of consequences. <laughs> but it really, a lot of course. Maybe the number one in my mind is teaching college. The teaching college in my mind has dropped as a whole. A lot of factors contributed to it. For example, the student ratio increased a lot of students, few faculty, and uh, a lot of new faculty, they are inexperienced, need a lot of training, and the class size grew, and a lot of big class. And uh, educational resources, oh, I think I, I made uh, some mistake. It should be educational resource per student. The total number, the total amount of the educational resources increased rapidly. <coughs> but when it's divided by the student, okay, the per student, Candidature is decreased rapidly. So, hmm. okay, I will share some story with my university. That is my university. <laughs> Dr. Jabe went to my university several times. Okay, but I don't think you have ever seen it. 
Yeah, it's really. Especially when at the time of examination, students use rent, get up very early, just wait in line to find their seat in the library. Oh, my university is one of the top 10. It's a national university. And uh, it's, it's OK. But even this university, oh, you look at the student, the tent, and the long line. Oh, OK. <laughs> what are you laughing? Do you know that? Where are they? Hulu. Oh, a lot of gifts. <laughs> you are, you say yes. Wow. That one is the second floor of a main library. That one is the undergraduate library. Wow. So, yes, it's dog therapy. Oh, oh. So that's why it's a so happy student here. In China, such kind of learning space, services, is incredible. Oh, I really admire you. And OK. And then the second, maybe another very serious negative consequences is unemployment. For example, this year, there are more than 6 million graduates. Oh. And uh, before, before they graduate, only half of them can find a job. And a lot of them, even at the end of the year, can never, cannot find a job. Even in the next year, it's also hard. So it will be become a very serious consequences. Yes, even this young guy, they're looking for a job. Well, Every time I see the picture, I find that I'm very lucky because I never, never worry about because when I graduate, I have no choice because I have to obey the government's rule. They ask me, go where? I should go where? But now, <laughs> they have to look for it. At that time, I just wait for it. And, uh, and there is another and many other serious consequences. For example, just you mentioned inequality and the quality uh, disparity, especially for the less development country and the disadvantaged group. Okay. Last, I would like to share a very short conclusion. In my mind, the massification of China. Chinese higher education, I think that is very efficient because in a very short time, with uh, limited resources, we become the number one biggest country with the higher education. But it's not so effective, especially the quality. And uh, I think that it, we need a bigger higher education. That means. The direction is right, but the pace, I think, is too quick and uh, is unreasonable. And uh, we made a lot of, we make remarkable achievements, but also with serious problem. What are the answers? What are the solutions to the problem? I don't know. <laughs> but uh, that's why I'm here. I'm here for 11 months. I find some solutions and answers. So I'm eager to go back to China. But I think we are still need your help. We are looking forward to your help and the suggestions. Okay. Welcome to China. <laughs> Happy New Year. National exam, yes. Um, you talked about curricular changes in this new curriculum. Um, on the one hand, are there any um, changes that are going on with the national exam that would uh, reflect changes in the curriculum? And are they tracking some of these new curricular changes in students who go through that program longitudinally or long term for how they're doing on the 
international thing. Yes, uh, uh, that, that's a big problem. Yeah. 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 Uh, collaborate each other yeah, to uh, push the reform. Uh, so the first, uh, uh, the, 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 it was a, yeah, initiated and uh, pushed uh, only by the, uh, by the department, mainly yeah, by the department of uh, uh, the basic education. So then the, the test, yeah, uh, I'm not sure, yeah, just uh, well, yeah, they uh, get the problem, yeah, why we say the teachers and principals uh, just uh, uh, dancing with the chain. Yeah, they, they need to face uh, uh, the, the, the non-reformed yeah, test. Now, yeah, you have, you have come to uh, uh, 2014, yeah, it's already uh, the two years past so, uh, from the 99 and so on, yeah. So uh, we come to the second uh, cycle. The key problem and the key target for the reform is the test reform. So we, we did have many different uh, uh, proposals for that. Yeah. Since last year, uh, uh, include the uh, high school, uh, hi high education, interest mm. examination, yeah. there was a big change. Yeah. We, uh, and in the school system, yeah, we, we uh, uh, some big ideas yeah, already yeah, uh, come out. Yeah. Think, yeah. uh, schools, uh, uh, university schools, maybe uh, just, uh, not just uh, 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 the enrollment, just not based on your uh, uh, the enrollment test form, yeah, but also uh, on the, uh, the formative yeah, record of the school, something like that. And also, yeah, we need to uh, limit the. Uh, the only one, yeah, uh, high, uh, uh, higher education interest examination, yeah, uh, 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 um, the, the, the place, yeah, uh, not just 100%, yeah, maybe uh, to 50%, uh, then yeah, leave other space for the uh, teachers, maybe uh, or anything other than the report. Yeah, it, 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 no, I didn't think that uh, I talked about that because uh, the time and also because yeah, it's uh, it's imperfect, yeah. Um, but it isn't. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. It it is yeah. So there. Yeah. I had a question. Um, is there a specific government policy that is encouraging Chinese students to uh, to do their higher education abroad, <coughs> or is it simply students not having space where they are? Um, what, what do you see as the primary reasons that so many Chinese students are coming to the US? US uh, maybe first one, the teaching college of the United States is really good. And uh, maybe the second one is that after nearly 30 years rapid growth of eco uh, economy, a lot of uh, middle income families, and uh, they can afford. And uh, it's also owing to the one child policy. So the family can afford it. And, uh, and then the government don't have encouraged you know, the high school graduates to study abroad. But they do encourage faculty like me to study abroad. That's why I'm here. In the last uh, uh, 20 years, in the years 30 years, the government really have a big investment to uh, uh, have a scholarship to help faculties to study abroad as a visiting scholar. But they s very few to uh, give money to uh, higher high school graduates to study abroad. But now it comes to postgraduate. Uh, after the visiting scholar, then comes to the, some PhD student, then comes to master student, can also have the central government scholarship to study abroad. But as I know by now, 
no money for the high school, no government money for the high school st student to study abroad. What is the tuition like in China? Tuition? Compared, compared with the United College and the University, China, Ch Chinese tuition is really no. And uh, uh, generally, uh, public college and university, generally 5,000 Chinese yuan. And uh, there are some, there are 300 and, and uh, three, we call it independent college, is, is private. And the tuition is about uh, 10,000 per year. So very cheap compared with <laughs> American universities. <laughs> you can't say one, just one reason. Yeah. Mm. Different people have different, uh, more than one reason. Yeah. So, <laughs> very complex. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, you need to support that, but also yeah, uh, for, for uh, some of the parents I know, yeah, I think yeah, they, part of their reason is that they uh, escape from uh, the too much test. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They enjoy your uh, very loosely uh, controlled. <laughs> So we we'll have our last question and then we can talk more during lunch <coughs> so that uh, we can move on with afternoon sessions, okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I was wondering, and the students that uh, study abroad carry their higher education degree abroad, are they perceived as more competitive when they go back to China? Are they finding jobs? Easier than those that study in China? I think it depends. The knowledge and the skill may be more advanced uh, what he get here. But in the network, maybe you know that China is very emphasized relationship. So they study here and got a degree here and they're well prepared here, but they, what they lack maybe experience and a social network is a very significant disadvantage for them. And then nowadays, it's hard for them to get a job, especially in the arts and the humanity and the social science. But if they are major in engineering <laughs> business, maybe it's much easier for them to find a job in Chinese labor market. So probably won't be able to find a job on <laughs> <laughs> But still welcome to China. <laughs>